Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. It is the second Sunday of Advent, and it is December already, so we are excited to see you. We're excited to sing some Christmas carols, so let's stand together and sing together, Angels We Have Heard on High. good to have everybody here. And before we ask the Lord to bless this service, um, I want you to keep in mind uh, the Ferguson family, Vasha, who had lost her sister this week. Uh, details for the funeral and visitation uh, have been in the email that we put out every week. So keep them in prayer. Father, we give you thanks and praise for the weather out today and the sunshine and the opportunity to just gather together to sing praise to you, to come under your word today. And we pray that the Spirit will fall upon us and help us see Jesus in new and refreshing ways. We want to have him lifted high. He is our Emmanuel. He is God with us. And as Christmas is approaching, help us to keep in mind the significance of his birth. We wish to give you all the praise and all the honor that you are due, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.
is time now for our Advent reading this morning. want to hear me right <laughs> all right last week we lit the candle of hope we will relight the candle as we light the candle for the second sunday in advent this is the candle of peace as we prepare for the coming of jesus we remember that jesus is our hope and our peace we will read the prophet isaiah and the apostle of john oh there he is a voice one of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged palaces places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Isaiah 43 through 5. The words of Jesus from the Gospel of John. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hands be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. John 14, 27. Let us pray. Gracious God, grant that we may find peace as we prepare for our Lord's birth. Many divisions in ourselves and our families will be peacefully resolved. May there be peace in our cities and the countries of the world. Help us to see the paths of peace in our lives and then give us the courage to follow them. Lord, let us remember that you are the only giver of lasting peace and that you are always with us. Amen. Let's stand together and sing again.
to die for me. Now death can't hold me down. Your resurrection power is bursting alive in me. see this morning. Good morning. Welcome to the second Sunday of Advent, and that is Peace Sunday. And we're all used to this idyllic scene, the beautiful scene of calm and peace that the shepherds were in. And as they were tending their sheep and trying to shovel the snow, because somehow we can't imagine winter without snow, Little naked babies with wings and no diapers came floating through the air. At least that's what I've seen in the pictures. And then there was one big angel, this lovely blonde girl with a white flowing dress that came and spoke peacefully to them, and they smiled and walked 10 feet over to the manger where Jesus was. Isn't that lovely? So we're, I'm going to dispel a few of those things this morning, but um, this was a real event. I kind of want to remind us of that because we get so used to the Christmas story that it, we forget that, it's the, that this is the advent, the coming of Jesus the Messiah, and it is a historical event. It really happened, and over the years it becomes replaced with beautiful, fun cartoon images that are nice decorations, but they start to turn us away from the reality of what happened. So uh, uh, it'll be, if I turn on my... Uh, Remote. Um, if you can turn, if you wish to turn in the scriptures and read from there, we're going to be reading from Luke chapter two, and I won't be preaching on all those verses, but I want to just read that whole section, and or you can look on the screen as well. So Luke chapter two, verses, verses one through fifteen. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David where he belonged, to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, 
A Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Now I want to look at this familiar scene and this morning we're going to take a fresh look at the angels. You've, you've probably heard many, many different messages on this passage. Often people will talk about the shepherds and how unlikely it was that the angels would come to announce the Messiah's birth to such people as shepherds because they were not regarded as, as decent people, you know. And, and people will go and, and talk and preach about Jesus in the manger and Lord at his birth. And there's a number of, there's many, many areas. We could talk about lessons from this passage for a number of weeks. But I want to talk about uh, the, sh the angels this morning and what they had to say. So, and I want to give you some background. When there, are, when there are words translated from Greek or Hebrew that expand on the meaning of the passage, I want to look at those to give us a broader understanding. So uh, the first word I want to look at is heavenly host. And that, um, that's the Greek word strati. And I'm telling you the Greek word probably doesn't do a whole lot for you, but I figure I should at least tell you what the Greek word is. And it literally, it can mean a literal army of soldiers, human soldiers. It can mean angels, or it can mean a star in the sky, because you, you've read that probably where the hosts of heaven are referring to stars or maybe angels. And so this implies an army. Now, and if you read some commentators, they describe the angelic host that came, you know, to announce and shout glory to God in the highest. They make it sound like a bunch of, you know, force recon ready to fight, you know, ah, and, and that's not really there. It's, it's a host. So it implies army, but it's, it's it, you know, so... But it's, it's not like they had, it doesn't say they had weapons, they weren't dressed in camo. We just know it was a host, a heavenly host of angels, the, the implication being an army. Then it talks about a great company. Now that's just one word, plethos. King James translates that word as multitude, which is actually what the definition of the word is. And it can mean a multitude or it can mean a bundle, it's just it's an interesting word to use here because I started thinking about this. Um, what are shepherds used to doing? And especially in that day. They didn't have, you know, nowadays they can fit sheep with radio collars and stuff. Actually, we, uh, when I worked at Zoetis, we had some farmers that fitted their cattle with RFI collars so they could track them, you know, and send out a drone and see a little radar ping. And they didn't have that. So... If you're a shepherd in that day and age, I'm just thinking you're used to being in low light conditions, you know, as it goes to evening, and or even in the morning, and you're looking out, how many, I don't know, a couple hundred sheep, I don't know how big their herds were, maybe more, and having a sense that, okay, yeah, that's about right, I don't think anybody's missing. So, however, when whoever reported this to Luke, who wrote down the Gospel of Luke, clearly had no idea. It was sort of like he said... There was just a lot. There was a huge number. I don't know how many. And preachers have tried to say, well, it was a legion of angels, or they, they try and say it was a specific number and try and tie that into. It just was a whole stinking lot of angels, enough that even if he could have counted them, I, you know, if I was one of the shepherds, I would have been on the ground. I would have been cowering. Even after he said, do not fear, I might have stood up. But then when this, who knows how many you know, when Jesus was facing the, his death, when he was going to the cross, he said, don't you know that I could call 12 legions of angels to come to my aid? I would just ask of the Father, and here they would be. Well, a legion's 4,800 4, soldiers. So here, Jesus said, I could call more than 50,000 angels to my, to my aid. Were there that? I don't know if there were that many. But here we have an army-like structure suddenly appearing and shouting, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Now, 
Were they singing? I used to think they were. I like the because I love music and I like the fact of thinking there's like thousands of people singing. It doesn't say anything about them singing. And if they're an army, that's pretty normal for an army to shout. Um, in fact, you know, and you might say, well, why were they shouting? Because nowadays our armies don't really shout. They're in tanks, they're in planes, no one can hear you shouting except on the radio. But in that day, that was pretty common. In fact, the Lord is pictured, the Lord God is pictured as a warrior on a number of occasions shouting. And so we have in Isaiah 42, verse 13, it says, The Lord will march out like a mighty man, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal with a shout. He will raise the battle cry. So as they went into battle, the armies would have a battle cry, and they would, you know, like you see in the movies, like Lord of the Rings or movies where everybody's got their swords drawn, and they're shouting and yelling. And, um, or in the Marvel movies where they're, they're shouting and flying and stuff. But there was a battle cry. Was, is that what was happening? Yeah, this is kind of the thoughts I was going through as I was preparing. I kept asking my wife, do you think I'm reading too much into this? As I thought through, why send this giant group that was kind of like an army, and why are they shouting? She said, well, that's because it was important. I said, but they didn't send an army to, when they told Mary. You know, when the angel said, Mary, do not be afraid. You are going to give birth to the Messiah and, and the whole, from the Holy Spirit. And then there wasn't a giant army of angels shouting, you're going to be pregnant, you're going to be pregnant. It did, didn't happen that way. It was all very quiet. So was this a battle cry? Were they, were they gearing up for a war with Satan? Was that what's what happening? Or was it a victory shout? Psalm 118, verse 15, shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. When the war is over and you've won, what do you do? There's a victory shout. Is that what was happening? Well, again, I still can't answer the question if I'm kind of reading way too much. I don't think I am. Here we have a ho the hosts of heaven. Was it the army of God? Was it the heavenly host that we, that we hear about every so often in the Old Testament? And if so, I, I kind of think, and again, so I wrote down in my notes, I, I wrote the word opinion, because I don't know if I can really dig my heels in on this one, but I think it was a victory shout. They were not at the beginning of a battle, they were at the conclusion of a victorious moment when all of history is leading up to this, prophecies, where he would be born, to whom he would be born, of the line and lineage of David, born to a virgin, in the city of David, all of it was happening just as God had said. Could Satan stop it? No, he did not. Jesus was born and laid in a manger, and they're shouting in victory because the birth of Christ is the beginning of hope. It's the hope of peace. And so this is a great victory, and they shall glory to God in the highest, and guess what? On earth, to those who, upon whom his favor rests, peace. It's not the, first, it's not the last time there'd be a victory shout, because you remember Jesus as he hung on the cross, and his time was finished, and he had bore the sins of the world for you and for me. He shouted, it is finished. And if you look at the tele... Oh, I can't get the Greek there. But I, can't, I didn't write it down. But the Greek word is, a, is not a shout of giving up. When Jesus was dying on the cross, he wasn't saying, well, I guess you win. He was saying, God wins. And there was a shout of victory that came from him. So what are they, what are they shouting? Glory to God in the highest and earth, on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Why is this a victory? What are they shouting about? Well, let's, let's look at that word peace. Let's look at the Greek word. And it's kind of odd. It just Actually, the, I, try, I reworded the definition. The definition is to join. But I thought that meant like, you know, I can join a club or I can join in. And if we're singing, I can join in. That's not what it means. It's taking two things that are separate and joining them together. And it has the implication of harmony and, and prosperity. And so I was really kind of puzzling over that because the angel said peace joining peace on earth well there's certainly i mean there's certainly not peace on earth there wasn't in that day i mean we talk about the peace of rome they built all these roads and wars ended but the way they got to the peace of rome was to just to kill a lot of people 
The Roman army slaughtered thousands and continued to do so to maintain the peace. There certainly was not peace in their day, and there isn't one Jew from the time of Christ that would say, we live in peace. They would say, we live in bondage to the empire of Rome, and if we're not careful, if we push the limits too much, our life is over. They're, they weren't Roman citizens. If they weren't Roman citizens, their lives were meaningless. They would not have said, we live in a peaceful time. I can't say that I live in a peaceful time. There's, even before there was war in Ukraine, there's wars going on constantly. I think, uh, what is it, in the book of Revelation, it talks about wars and rumors of wars, and fighting will continue. I, so at this point, I'm, again, I'm struggling as I'm preparing this message, thinking I don't get it. The, the angels couldn't have gotten it wrong, but there certainly is not peace on earth. What does this mean? And I think it's important to understand that peace is not the absence of conflict. It's not the absence of tragedy. It's not the absence of suffering. Because that is peace. That fits the definition. But the most important kind of peace, the peace that would cause the angels to shout and celebrate in victory, is peace with God. See, this is the foundation. This is the beginning of everything. If you don't have peace with God, then you don't have hope. If you're you don't have peace with God, then you have no future. If you don't have peace with God, you are not safe in this world. This is the beginning. This is why the angels would shout, because this peace with God, this is the promise and hope of the future and life and eternity. You see, be, and, but and even the word, the, to join, you see, we are at birth because of, we have a sin nature. We are separate from God. He is completely righteous, and we are sinful. I'm a nice guy, but I know I have a sin nature. I've seen, <laughs> and, and even though I have a little sin, I'm not, a, I'm not Adolf Hitler, all right? That's the big sin. Uh, I haven't robbed a bank, even though I think I might have figured out ways. When I was a kid, I was always trying to, right? When, anybody else do that when you're a kid and you're waiting for mom to come out of the bank? This is before online banking. I would sit there and try and figure out how I could rob the bank like I saw on TV, if I had robbed the bank, that would have been sin, but not as bad as Hitler, right? No, I'm just a little, but God is so holy, he is so righteous, he is so pure, and he despises sin, he must punish it. And Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned. All of us are separated from God from the time of Adam and Eve throughout every, all the thousands of years since. We are all separated from God, and because he is absolutely just, he must judge sin. It says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. This is harsh for Christmas. I apologize. But this is the reality of it. We are, you know, if I look around the room, I, this, you're, you're all such nice people. And you don't do too many bad things. It's not... You know, maybe some of you, you're not probably going around killing people, you're not stealing, you're not doing all the, the, the list of big bad things. And so it's easy to forget how we stand in relation to God, how that we have no hope of God liking us or wanting us in his presence. We are rejected by God at birth because at birth we are sinners even in the Old Testament stories, you know, when God called the people to himself and he built a tabernacle in a place where they could make offerings for a covering for sin, do you know there was a special place within the temple called the Holy of Holies? And you weren't allowed to go in there except once a year, and there had to be an extra offerings and all this stuff to happen so that when the high priest, only him, walked into the Holy of Holies, he wasn't struck dead. Why? God hates sin. We can't underestimate that. I feel like a good person, but I have to be honest with you, at heart, by at birth, I'm not, and neither are you. We're separated from God, and that's really, really terrible, even though it doesn't feel so bad sometimes. We, you know, we have a good life. We are separated from God, and if we're separate from God, we have no hope. So when Jesus, our Savior, is born, the hope of being rejoined with God is born. The hope of having peace with God and a relationship with God. 
And I, I think about, you know, here, here's the guy, guy, I'm sorry, the man upstairs that's, no, sorry. <laughs> the being who created the entire universe is reaching out to us for a relationship. But because of the separation that must be between him and sin, he provides Jesus Christ, who came as a man, born of a virgin, lived his perfect sinless life, and then when he died on the cross and was broken, then beaten. The, the, the scriptures say in Isaiah, by his wounds we are healed. Because there's a penalty for crime. There's a, there's a cost you have to pay when, when bad happens. When you're, when you're the author of bad, and, and because God is so pure, the cost of sin is very high. And Jesus, because he was sinless and perfect, was able to pay the cost for all. And now... Because with the shedding of his blood, Jesus, who was sinless, took on himself. They call it the scapegoat. You ever? He took on to himself all of the sin and bore it away from us. And we received instead credit for his righteousness. That is why after suffering on the cross as Jesus was dying, he shouted in victory, it is finished, because at that point, sin was finished, sin was broken, the death had no more power, and, and a way was open for us to have peace with God. And I don't have the power to do that. I don't have the, the intelligence or the wisdom to do that. I'm not good enough. I never could be. But I can reach out to God and say, yes, please, will you, yes, I don't. I don't know, if, you know, when I was young and when I, was, when I felt God, God's call in my life and I, I wanted to be forgiven, I didn't know what to say. I just said, will you forgive me? I didn't know anything in depth. I hadn't studied the Bible. But it doesn't depend on me. It all depends on the work of Jesus and the power and grace of God, which is extended freely to us. And that is why at the birth of Christ, at the mo when he was born and laid in the manger, that was a victory. Because now there's no stopping. There's no stopping Jesus growing and becoming the teacher that he was and, and the sinless perfect man and dying on the cross. It had begun. The hope had dawned. And so they shouted, peace, rejoining. We can be one. We can be close to God. You know, this frees me from fear. Now, I, I, so I'm one of those people, you probably can't tell because I just had to deal with it, but I have one of those things called generalized anxiety disorder. I didn't know what it was when I started getting it, although it runs in my family. I even, <laughs> I even studied my, my, one of my relatives studied our ancestors and found records of uh, mental illness and that kind of thing all the way back into the 1800s. And I, I feel terrible for my ancestors because in the 1800s, treatments were just awful. But so... Um, I feel my heart rate shoot up, and I, I, sometimes I feel afraid just to walk into a room. I don't have to be afraid. And that's one of the things, one of the tools, one of the crutches, if you will, for me is to say, I know that Jesus, is, God has called me to do this, and I know that he's waiting on the other side. My wife, one day, and I was preaching every weekend, sometimes two or three times a weekend, and it was getting, I was just getting to think, I can't, how can I do this? And my wife looked at me and said, God will sustain you. Well, you know what? Since I'm a believer, and since I've received his grace, I can have peace with God, and I can know that he is for me. He's on my side. He's not out to, he's not, he's not waiting with a big baseball bat. Oh, is he going to screw up? Oh, he's doubting me? Pow. Oh, he said a swear word when he shouldn't. Wham, it hits two hits on the head for that. No. I mean, that's what we think about God. That's kind of what, you know, some of the preaching when I was kid, you better watch it. God's going to smack you around if you're not careful. No. He, there is judgment, there are consequences for sin, but you know what? I am his child. I am forgiven and cleansed. And yeah, if I mess up, I go to him and say, I'm sorry. Guess what he does? He cleanses me again from all unrighteousness. He is on our side if you're a believer. You have peace with God. He is for you. He is working to help you every moment of every day. I can get up in the morning and if I'm having anxiety, I can say, you know what, God? I know you're with me. You know I'm afraid, and I know you're powerful. I'm just going to walk with you. We don't have to be afraid. 
The scriptures say, therefore we will not fear, though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. That's way worse than walking into a room full of scary people. (laughs) You know, peace with God does not mean the absence of conflict. Peace with God does not mean that difficult times Commit, won't come into my life. Peace with God does not mean that my brain's going to work right and I'm not going to be anxious anymore. Peace with God means that I have someone to hold my hand, someone far more powerful than I am. You know, when I was a little boy, about eight years old, I was taking a shower, which little boys don't like to do, but, and we had a power outage. I mean, it went from lots of light to pitch black. And I'm, I, rem, I can still remember shaking in fear. Because when you're a little kid, dark is scary. <laughs> I probably scream. I, I, don't, I don't remember screaming, but I'm sure I did. I remember crying. I can still remember that because what I also remember is my dad coming in. And my dad wasn't that big. But if when you're eight, dad is big. And he walked in, and I remember running out of the shower, butt naked and dripping wet, and grabbing his leg. It was still pitch black. The dark was still scary. I wasn't that scared anymore. As long as I held it, I'm sure, I don't know how he walked out of the, you know. He put his hand on me, told me it was okay, he helped me dry off, helped me put my pajamas on. He didn't make fun of me, he didn't mock me. Because he knew I was experiencing something scary. Don't you? I kind of think maybe that's where God is. It says in the Psalms, He knows our frame. He knows that we are but dust. I love that verse. You'll probably hear me say it a lot. Because I know that if my dad is capable of that kindness, that compassion toward me as his son, God is even more capable of holding me when I'm afraid, of walking with me. I might still be afraid during difficult times. But I know I can walk through them when I have God, peace with God. So, um, but before we go too much farther, there is something that we have to be careful about. That's false peace. So think for a moment. When we think of peace, we think of you know, troubled times. I feel troubled. Bridge over troubled water, if you've ever heard that song. You know, things are just stirred up, and, and uh, you know, I, I want to feel calmer. So what do we do? What do we see on TV? Well, I could share you a drink right now. Well, yeah, let me buy you one. And, and they tip it back, and then they all smile. Why? Because alcohol relaxes you. And so is, is that something that's in your life? You know, delicious, fine wine. I'm, I don't even, not saying that that's bad. You know, to enjoy a delicious red wine. However, sometimes that can become, alcohol can become a source of peace. Because what happens when you say, well, I know that's not Friday and I know it's one in the afternoon, but I sure could use that same feeling right now. And it becomes a regular thing. Or it could be a, a, a drug. We, we seek things out that calm our brain, that calm the waters when we're troubled. And, and it's, or sometimes people laugh and call it self-medicating, teehee. It's a false peace. And the thing that you'll notice about false peace is it's never enough. I mean, we'd say, I never get enough of God. But that's a whole different, as I, as I engage with God and I seek him out and I come closer to God, it builds me up. It makes me healthier. It makes me more whole. But as I seek false peace, which I so often do because I want to be in control, it consumes me. It, it wears me down. It takes from me, and I, ha- I, have to, I don't get the peace because it's an addiction. So many, so many of us, are. it could be TV, you know? And what happens is when someone interrupts the false peace that we're seeking, you know, maybe the only way I could turn my brain off and, and just think, not think for a minute and not feel so crappy is to watch... Well, I, actually, I did this. It was Sunday nights. I hated my job. I was miserable. I didn't know what to do with my life. So I would, Marge would go to bed, and I'd stay up and watch the X-Files because it was just weird. And I, for, for an hour of TV, I didn't have to think about anything important. And it felt, it felt kind of good. 
I mean, it's dumb, really. I tried watching the X-Files recently. But, but we all have TV shows or sports shows, and guess what happens when it's not on? I got kind of angry. When someone takes that false piece away, I get mad. What do we do with that? Well, I want to give you some things that I've been thinking through. I thought, all right, because I'm not good at peace. I'm not good at calm. <laughs> um, so I thought, okay, Adam, in the next week, what are you going to do to try and build peace and, and not go after false peace? Because it's easy to do. I mean, oh, look at that giant bag of cookies, you know, and you eat half a bag of cookies. How do you feel? You know the world's a good place. I better eat another half a bag. Make, you know, if I eat two bag, full bags of cookie, then I'm in heaven. You know, but what happens after about six or seven bags of cookie? You're I, actually, I actually went through like a... This is gonna, I'm not being entirely silly. It sounds kind of silly. But I went through a Snickers addiction. Because I, and I had one at work. Someone said, you want one of these Snickers? I said, sure. And I ate one and I thought, man, I feel good. Because I never have sugar. But man, I was buzzed with all that sugar. And they said, well, here, have some M&Ms. So I had, I was got to a point, I had to keep eating more sugar to feel that good feeling. So I was having two cups, two full cups of M&Ms and four Snickers. And then one day I went, what am I doing to myself? It was a source of false peace. And I had to recognize that I was harming myself. So we have to start asking ourselves, all right, is this I, here I am on the golf course. Is this just a fun hobby, or is this starting to take over? Am I starting to put it in the wrong place? Psalm 139 says, search me, O God. So this week, I encourage you to, to get God with you, to join you. That's a funny way of saying it. And say, God, will you search me and show me, is there any areas in my life where I'm reaching out for false peace? And God, will you show me where areas where I'm actually living in and experiencing the peace of God so I can celebrate that? Because we, so often we focus on, well, here's where I'm messing up and I need to fix. You know, there may be areas in your life where God shows you, yeah, you know, when, when you, the bad thing happened at work, but you were calm because you trusted God, that was, that was a true peace. That was peace of God. And thank him for it. Celebrate it. And then we need, like anything else, if we want peace, we've got to start cultivating it. And well, how do you do that? Well, I'm sorry, it's the same answer as for almost everything. There's reading the Bible. There's thinking and studying in the Bible. There's prayer. And, I mean, you know, that's, that's the answer to everything in Sunday school. Read the Bible and pray? Yes, yes, thank you, good answer. But that is the truth. As we starve ourselves from the bread of life, the Word of God, and I found this is very true for me, the, the less I'm in here... The more, the more difficulties I have managing the generalized anxiety disorder. It's, this isn't the, necessarily the cure, but this sure is a great crutch. No one wants to say the word crutch, but I need this. This is a stretcher, like a hospital gurney, <laughs> right? This is, if you don't got this, then it's going to be hard to have peace because you're on your own. We need to get our minds in here. And maybe one thing I would add to read the Bible and pray was be preached to yourself. And I'm not, I didn't come up with that. That's not a new idea. I've heard other people say that. You know, what does that mean? To start thinking in your mind me, or meditating on a passage of Scripture and asking yourself, how can I live this out? What can I do in my life? Or how is my thinking not fit with this passage? It's like going to a church service and hearing a preacher, but it's you working through the text yourself. And the third is don't stop. Don't give up you are going to mess up. You're probably better at it than I am. <laughs> but you are going to get to a point where you think, oh, I'm tired of trying. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season what? You'll reap. The Lord, that, that's God's call to us to keep focused on him, to keep reaching for peace. Now, now, there's some of you in this room that go, I don't really know what he's talking about. I have peace every day. That's just how God built me. And to you, I say, God bless you. But for the rest of us that have those, some of us have the occasional difficult day and others are born in turbulent waters. That's me. And I have to really put forth effort. Regardless of where you are on that spectrum, don't give up. If you feel like giving up and you need some encouragement, email me, call me, text me. I'd love to just stand with you in the storm if you need it. Because the Lord is there. His peace, his presence is not dependent on my feelings. 
In fact, sometimes my feelings are lying. Now, I shouldn't dismiss my feelings. They mean something, but they don't always mean what I think they mean. It says, uh, you will keep them in perfect peace when their mind is steadfast because they trust in you. I kind of paraphrase that, but that's in Isaiah. Peace comes with a steadfast devotion to trusting God. So don't let go. And maybe the last thing, I feel like I'm doing a seminar. I'm not usually giving this too many pointers, but these are scriptural items. I encourage you this week to make an effort, especially in our, this, the world we live in that is so, um, everybody's just fighting. Do you, am I the only one that sees that? Everybody's just sort of angry with each other, back and forth, just about everything. And Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And in Romans, Paul said, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, why would I do that? Because no one can take anything from you. Everything I need is in Christ. All I have is Christ. And my future and eternity is in Christ. So that you can't hurt, no one can hurt you. No one can make you afraid. No one can take anything from you that you truly need because God will give it to you, all that you need for life and godliness so we can give peace to others, even when someone's wronging us. Now, that doesn't mean we don't, you know, if someone's breaking the law, we don't call the police, but we don't have to lash out ever. We can always turn the cheek and, and feel strong because we have the peace of God in our lives. And we, he, just as God in Christ freely gave that peace to us when we didn't deserve it, we can turn and freely give grace and peace to others. So I encourage you this, this week to be a peacemaker and to, to celebrate uh, the season of peace. So as we go to a time of silent prayer, pray as the Spirit leads you. But I, I hope you'll ask the Lord, just say, Lord, is there something in this message today that's for me specifically? That is there an error, something that you need me to understand in a new way or that you need me to act on? Please show me. And I know that God's spirit will work in your life. Let's go to prayer.
being the first Sunday of the month, we have the opportunity to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And as we have done since the beginning of the pandemic, I'm going to invite you to come and slip out of your seat and partake of the elements, and then we will celebrate together once uh, everyone is at their seat. But i got to tell you something, okay? So something a little different, because if you're noticing, there's just what looks like the cup. But we have something sneaky. Underneath the juice is the bread. Okay, so you don't have to worry about opening up a plastic bag. You don't have to worry about someone touching that and passing it on. You don't have to worry about anybody sneezing. I'll, I'll take that there so you don't think I have my germs on it. Okay, so if you come up and you're looking for the bread, you're not going to find it, uh, as you would typically, but it will be there. And so let us come and partake. Of all. 